And I have the pleasure of helping out at the Oakville Film Festival and now the Milton Film Festival as a host. And this is the most fun that I have because I get to talk to the people who inspire the movies that you watch. And I'm gonna ask a few questions and then I'm gonna throw it out to the audience. And as I understand it, we have three amazing gifts for the people who ask the best question. I'm excluded, so I don't get one. Um, okay, so congratulations on a really great film. How did you get involved in this project? Ever since COVID, my memory of like what happened in the last four years is a bit of a mess. Um, Try menopause. Um, <laughs> I, I only get a close contact with somebody going through it. So um, I've been complaining about flashes, but I won't get into that. <laughs> I was approached by Rob McCallum, who is the director who is responsible for crafting and really developing the relationship with the family in the first place and getting all the permissions and the access and everything. And I was approached during COVID. I think it was 2020 was our first summer of shutdown. We were tending to the Victory Garden that we were helpful for uh, bearing fruit from. And Rob called me and he, they had no financing. They had an idea, they had access. And uh, he had approached Marble Media. You saw their logo up front, who had done a lot of children's television. I've made features in the past. We had some mutual connections and he asked if I was interested in helping figure out a way to uh, create a path forward to make the movie because to make these things obviously just takes money. It's labor intensive. There's lots of rights and stock and everything else. Um, and I have an agreement with my partner who's also my wife that will discuss everything in great detail before taking things on as a company. And I came out of the meeting with Rob and I said, I broken all the rules, we're gonna go help make a Mr. Dress Up film. And uh, she was like, and she wasn't born in, or she was born in Canada, but grew up her first 15 years in Italy, so didn't have the same connection to Mr. Dress Up. And I was like, no, it's gonna be fine. We're gonna get it made. It's not just gonna be one of these things we suffer with for years before it gets uh, uh, on the screen and able to share with audiences. And that was the summer of 2020, COVID, and- uh, Surprise. Yeah, we made it, and we're here now. So uh, were you and have you always been a big Mr. Dress Up fan or did you grow to love him more through the film or both? I would say both. I had a mother who hated television so I've like really disappointed her uh, earlier on in life. <laughs> now that there's been some success, it's like oh, okay. And I was not allowed to watch a lot of TV. Mr. Dress Up was always allowed in the house around dinner time and after school because there was no screaming. It wasn't people screaming and yelling and saying the word shut up to people. It was very calm. So even though we were allowed to watch it and I grew older and I had a younger sister, I probably watched Mr. Dress Up past where I should have been developmentally <laughs> uh, and did the crafts and got better of, at them as time went on. So I was a huge, I was a big fan. And you still do the crafts in your basement today, right? I still, the crafts all the time. I make, I still like making things. And that's like why, yeah, one reason I actually went into this industry is like you have to like the process. It's really wonderful to share it with people and get up on a stage and do Q and A's and all of that sort of stuff, but you have to like the process of making the actual thing, the detail. So let me ask you, the, the individuals who spoke about Mr. Dressup's influence on their lives, the bare naked ladies and all of those. Was it flashy did, famous people? Flashy Good famous people. for the people. marketplace. Well, no. they're Canadian famous, right? It was very. It's sorry. I'll let you ask your question. Was it easy to get them to participate? Yeah, that was. The, usually, you're really chasing people to try to get them to be in the docu documentaries, and especially people who are famous or celebrities or whatever term you want to use. Uh, because of the shared experience of Mr. Dress Up, because of the innocence of, and the kindness and all the things, there was no, you know, no skeletons coming out of the closet, no research was discovered that wasn't included. People sort of jumped the, the chance to reflect on their own childhood and love of somebody who, I assume many of the people here had a relationship with uh, watching Mr. Dress Up and stuff and 
so did all those celebs. And I think those folks being actors like Scott Thompson, in theater, the tickle trunk is still a thing that's referred to as a term. I think there was a lot of resonance and people were happy to uh, agree to participate. So I'm gonna ask one more question then I'll see if there's some in the audience. What was the most challenging aspect of this production? <coughs> I, I don't wanna to sound too negative. Like all productions are challenging. This one, the most challenging thing was having the resources to be able to go through the thousands of hours of stock footage and then also having a director who is such a loving kind human being and also a super fan um, our, the first cut w the producers were delivered was four hours and 20 <laughs> minutes and even though i'm a big fan of mr dress up and developmentally i watched past the stage four hours and 30 minutes was a lot knowing that you had to get it down to a manageable more consumable. You did a great period. job though because it still took you on a really great journey and then at the end, I don't know if anybody else was wishing they had bought Kleenex, I was like. <laughs> um, okay, so are there any questions in the audience? So the scene at the end, Rob McCallum, the director, and I don't <clears throat> want to misquote this story, but he was watching with his three-year-old. There were about 10 episodes that had been released on YouTube that CBC finally got the rights cleared and they put up on YouTube. And he had watched those 10 episodes with his three-year-old and watched how they reacted to it and hooked into the ethos of the show and really loved it. And they kept on watching it. And, the idea for him was born by watching his son watch it and relate to it. And he thought, oh, this is still really relevant today. Why is it at least, why aren't the reruns available at least to be able to show to people and, uh, you know, and non-commercial television and all of these things? So he went about, originally it was called Saving Mr. Dress Up and it was a bit of a quest to get all of the archives, archives restored to try to get all the episodes back on TV. That didn't make it into the narrative structure of the doc, although it's something that we're actually working on right now with the CBC to try to get a whole bunch of episodes on. So, And then the scene at the end where all the children are watching the show, we actually filmed kids watching the show to see how they would hook in, because one of the theses or hypotheses we were playing with was it is still relevant to children because it's not talking about current events, it's talking about life living really, experiential things. So I think it would play very well. And interestingly, you know, all that do-it-yourself stuff that you do the arts, like half of YouTube channels are people showing people how to do things. So it's like what's new is old and old is new again and all of that. I do think the attention uh, span, at least with my own children who are teenagers and grew up on the social media is crap and gonna destroy our world long term, but and that's a different <laughs> conversation for a different day. Yeah, because my thought was, it was related to your question, because I was thinking, I would, I, I have a background in psychology, so I think of this kind of stuff, but I'm wondering what the impact of having a Mr. Dress Up in your life as a childhood during your formative years versus not having that, I wonder if there's a difference in the society that we live in now, like an impact from that, if there's gonna be a trickle down not a, not a tickle trunk, but a I, trickle down. That was good. Okay. Points from the pun. <laughs> um, that was just a thought, not a question. Um, any other questions from the audience? We do have microphones. Oh. That's interesting. <laughs> when you make a film, you do a deep dive into no matter what it is. So we, as a, me as an individual, I've been involved in documentary features, but also in narratives, and you do kind of fall into the world. There was something, and there's been something when showing the film where the love for the subject beforehand, 
And then the connection and the shared experience with audiences all over the country, because we've been able and fortunate enough to have it play in a whole bunch of places, has been special on a different level. And I'm often really critical of everything that we produce and make, because I've got a madness to me. Um, this film, even though I still have notes in my head when I watch it, which the director would be furious for me saying out loud, the, the experience and the shared experience of watching this has been different, and I think there's a nostalgia aspect of my own childhood and memory and stuff that comes out. It's been pretty special. And like, for instance, we've sh I showed it, we showed it in Halifax during the hurricane, the, s the brother of the woman who called in to Pamela w Wallen's show recognized his sister's voice and that it was her calling in. Like, there's been all these neat little connections and now we email with each other. So like, those types of things have been fun and different and I think unique to, you know, Canadians' shared experience with this person. How much input did the director allow you to have in, the, in any aspect of the film? Was it oh, he ignored me all the time, okay. and I continued with my input. So normal TV set. There's a, yeah, no, it's a, it's a back and forth, you know? And it's really tough when you work with somebody you haven't worked with previously, like, it's a marriage. You get to know how they think, because everybody thinks a little bit differently. You can have the same conversation, and you know. So there were nights you were sleeping on the couch? There were nights I was sleeping on the couch, but it was, it was actually a very positive, I think Mr. Dress Up's, uh, calmness and kindness led the interpersonal relationships with the cast and the crew. It would which have been is really generally <laughs> the way it actually is. It would have been really weird though to do a movie about such a kind, gentle, and caring person like and fighting. everybody's just like, man, no. geez, we're on set again. That would have been really funny. Uh, any other questions? Has Mr. Dress Up ever been syndicated or shared outside of Canada? Don't, I think they were, he was, syn, I don't know if he was syndicated. He was rebroadcast on CBC for about eight years after the show stopped airing. I'm unaware of it playing anywhere outside of Canada. Now the border towns, obviously there was lots of resonance in the Vermonts and the, I'm gonna trade the, and the Detroits, the Michigans, like in the border states, actually we got lots of mail and when it played on Amazon originally, like they knew Mr. Dress Up. They covered it in the press down there and stuff like that. But now it's, that was one of the wonderful and surprising things about Amazon coming on early as an early partner and they took worldwide rights. So it's playing in about 60 countries right now is their belief that a little bit of politics obviously was Bill C-11 and being a good new citizen, corporate citizen in the country, but they, they took it on even though it um, hadn't played in England and hadn't played in Spain and is playing in all those countries now, so. That's great though, that they came on so early and they were eager. They were eager and they, we pitched a bunch of Americans with them and they um, said, we have no idea who you're talking about, but you were really passionate, it was really interesting, and they came back a day and a half later after doing a little bit of internet research and learning and speaking to people in the Canadian office, and they were on pretty much right away. Amazing. Yeah. Any other questions? No, got a woman here. You said you still do uh, arts and crafts in your basement. So what is your arts and crafts in your basement? What's your biggest arts and crafts the, project? The making films is my arts and crafts. Is so what no big is. toilet paper roll castle? No, no I, my children are now 19 and 15, so I clean up their toilet paper roll. But, uh, <laughs> I have, they have stopped wanting to play with me in that sense, much to my chagrin. Do they want to play with you with your arts and crafts though, or do they want do they want to follow in your they footsteps, just want or are they just like order them Uber and yeah, like okay. yeah, don't dad, come on. Leave us. Oh, alone. the nineteen year olds starting to come back. You know how they leave and then they come back. The nineteen year olds coming back. Gotcha. That's good. Yeah, she needs money. <laughs> <laughs> in university. I think we have time for one more back. question. Okay, one more. Make it a good one. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Here, I have a question right here. Um, Jennifer mentioned something about this, and, and it sort of came up in the, in the film as well, but since he sort of uh, was throughout the formative years of Canada, the years that you like to think of Canada, 
coming into being Canada, uh, with 650,000 kids watching that show every day and being so nice. It, I, I wonder if there isn't something to this idea that part of our niceness might have come from so many kids growing up watching Mr. Rogers, or Mr. Dress Up, and Mr. Rogers, I suppose. Yeah, I don't want to speculate on deep psychology, but I do think there is, uh, so, you know, like you do watch the world and it's bitterness and hate these days, and there are a few generations that grew up proselytize, not only with Mr. Dress, well, with Mr. Dress Up, but in our school, like it is something that has been culturally taught in Canada that kindness is important, and reinforced in TV, reinforced in a lot of things, and I think there is something true yeah, I mean, and, and uh, with generational the, about uh, that. How many shows in this country have ever attracted 500,000 uh, eager minds every day seeing a nice guy? I mean, it, it, it does make you wonder. It does, it's, um, and did, when did, I did, did Mr. Dress Up make us nice? <laughs> well, he came Which off came the air first? in 94, Six, I think, was the year that he came off the air, and that was kind of New Gingrich, zero sum politics coming out of the states. Like you start, so I don't want to <laughs> make these grand connections, but on a superficial level, there might be some real truth to that. And I do think, looking back and hearing all this and seeing this in today's climate and today's worries that many of us have, I think that this film is resonating with people on a different level and the importance of those things. Bruce McCullough says it, like maybe kindness isn't the most important thing, but maybe just our simple interpersonal connections actually are. Well, thank you. I just, one last question for you. What's next for you? I'm gonna drive home on that terrible highway. Um, <laughs> we, uh, I was one of the producers on the movie Brother, which um, is on Crave right now, which was at TIFF a couple of years ago, and we have we have a film called uh, The Players, which we're just finishing up our editorial and post on right now, which is a dramatic feature. We shot a Sukian Lee movie called Paying For It, where she was the director, uh, which is not a Mr. Dress Up talk topic, based on a Chester Brown novel dealing with things in the sex industry and trade. And uh, we're doing a doc series called Who Owns the World? and uh, doing another documentary called Give Me Some Truth about uh, conspiracy theories and conspiracists and how nothing has changed over 500 years except for media and delivery systems and how many people are thinking this way. That sounds awesome. All uplifting, <laughs> like dark, fa it was really nice making something that is nice and wonderful and celebrate and nos nostalgic. Because often, often our cinema is about yeah people dealing with grief and isolation and all of these things. So, thank you guys thank for you coming very out. Much. Thank you. And thanks to the Milton uh, Film Festival. Thank you, Milton. For, and remember, they us. have really a series it. of short films that you can purchase. Purchase them; they are amazing. That short film at the beginning of the movie was awesome. Yeah, well done, uh, team. That looked great. I really enjoyed it.